Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Beth coming at you from my closet in North Carolina. Hey, this is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. What's going on? What's going on? How are you doing? I'm I'm good. I feel energized. Same. I'm- yes. I have been on my game this week. I will tell you, I have been super busy and I've been subbing at my kids' school and I've been really on my game. Well, good for you. Doing all good. the things. And let me tell you, so Monday, I subbed at my kids' school Monday, which is a terrible idea. Don't ever do that on Mondays if you have a choice. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> we had friends in town this weekend and I was tired. So, and I had no food in my house and it was, I was on the struggle bus, but I did it. I got my kids to school. I got to school. I did my makeup. I put on regular pants. I went, we came home from, (laughs) I worked, I did a great (laughs) job. And then I came home from school and I was cleaning my house a little bit and I made dinner and I was like, I am winning. Monday. Like I am, I'm this great subber. I'm a great mom. I've checked all my boxes today. I'm still wearing my regular pants. So proud of you. Super good, (laughs) right? So I put an earbud in my ear and I was like, I'm going to make dinner. I'm going to listen to a podcast because I've been busy all day and zone out and make dinner. And I was like bebopping around my kitchen, you know, just making dinner. And I don't know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever, however long it takes. And my doorbell rings. And I was like, well, that's weird. Why are they ringing my doorbell? Why is UPS ringing my doorbell? Just leave it on the porch, whatever. So I go and get the door and it's this lady standing there and she's like, hi, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but do you have children? And I was like, (laughs) yes. (laughs) And I'm like immediately like looking around my house, like, where are my children? (laughs) And she's like, well, I was just running by and there's somebody screaming help in your backyard <laughs> and I was like I know <laughs> oh my gosh I'm like oh, okay thank you she's like I think they're stuck or like they're screaming pretty loudly and and a lot of tears and so I just wanted to let you know because I didn't want to just come in your yard and help them but they definitely need help it that's been going on a couple of minutes now <laughs> Like, my name's just standing in front of your house like what's yes and she was yelling back at him apparently okay so I'm like thank you so much I'll get you help yes exactly like my name's Beth nice to meet you gotta go so I run in my backyard and my five-year-old is stuck about 15 feet up in a tree (laughs) and his his pants had gotten looped around like a branch in the tree and he literally was like hanging there. Oh no. It was so bad. It was so bad. When I mean it's funny now, but like it could have gone so bad. And I see him and I'm immediately like, oh my gosh. Like, so I'm not gonna cook with my earbud anymore. Well, maybe just one. That's what I learned. Or did you only have one? I did just have one. Oh. I was really zoned out. Yeah, you are. <laughs> and the door was closed. <laughs> anyway, nice neighbor. I don't know if you listen. Thanks for the help. <laughs> but he told me later that she was like, are you okay? And he was like, no, I'm not okay. I, no one will come back here. I've been screaming forever. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> uh. Anyway. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, I'm Happy glad you Monday. Great story. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. There we go. All right. Do you have any news? <laughs> I don't. I don't. I mean, that made my morning. It made my day. <laughs> and now I'm ready for you to tell me some more stories that are okay. not going to make my day. <laughs> exactly. I have another one. Okay. This case that we're getting into today is a recommendation by our listener, Maddie. Yes. And this is a really interesting case. This case takes us way back to the 1930s. Oh, wow. The 1930s. So we're just to set the scene for you. We have jazz music. We have the stock market crash, the height of the Great Depression, you know, good times, those Mm -hmm. 1930s. Yep. Mm -hmm. And also in this case, I'm going to work backwards. So I'm going to start with the crime 
and then work backwards. And I'm going to walk you through the investigation and we're just going to learn what happens as we go, just like it really played out. Okay. Okay. Also trigger warning. This does involve children. It's not graphic, but awful. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Okay. On November 24th of 1934, Two men were cutting firewood in Pine Grove Furnace State Park. It's a weird name for a park. And it's near Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So it's in Cumberland County, Pennsylvania, Pine Grove Furnace State Park. The two men, as they were cutting firewood, noticed kind of off in the distance that there was a green blanket in the woods. And it looked very strange because it looked like it was covering like a hill. Or like a like a mound or something. Like there's there was something under the blanket. So they walk over and they pull the blanket back and underneath they find three young girls. The girls what? Yes. <laughs> the girls were obviously dead. And the two men ran to a nearby business because there's no cell phones or payphones, and they called the police. Okay, so here's your trigger. So if you want to fast forward 30 seconds, here's your chance. The girls were very well dressed. They were in nice dresses. They had on nice winter coats that had fur around the collars, cute little knee socks, nice little Mm -hmm. shoes. They all three had similar haircuts and it was pretty obvious that they were sisters because they all looked a lot alike. This was later confirmed by hair analysis, by the way. The age ranges for the girls were estimated to be between 7 and 12 or so. And they were placed side by side. And the oldest girl's arm was draped around the younger two. Oh. Yes. Mm. The medical examiner determined that the girls had been suffocated. And their cause of death was officially listed as suffocation by external means. It was also determined that the girls had no food in the last 18 hours prior to their death. Oh, so this no. was just something that they noted. Other okay. than that, that's all they knew. So they had okay. no idea who these children were. So, and most likely they were put in that position because if they were suffocated, I was thinking like, was she trying to take care of her, ch- her little um, sisters? Like when all something was happening to them, but most likely they no, they were definitely placed there. They believe that they, I mean, they may have been um, killed there, but they were they were positioned right. in that way, mm-hmm. like lovingly. I know, I know. That's that's why I was thinking like she was trying to take care of them, like mm-hmm. you know, comfort them when whatever something was happening to them. But yeah, not. and their clothes were like pristine too, which was I mean that was noted because it wasn't like they had like they were torn at all or they were ruffled in any way. It was like they were dressed and then laid there. Mm-hmm. So a frenzy began to determine the identity of these three young girls. So we don't have DNA, remember. So the way that we don't they, have anybody reported missing at that time. Right. I mean, okay. I that so was. that was the first thing they did. They had no local missing children that matched the sisters' description anywhere in the area. So they launched a nationwide search. Okay. Let me just sidebar. Something I learned about the 1930s is that their death investigation practices were really weird. Banana, actually. (laughs) And I understand. They were limited means. And so it's easy for us to look back now and be like, what is that about? But at the time, that was their options. but, But it's still weird. Okay. So photos of the three girls laying in the woods. So like the crime scene were printed in national newspapers. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that terrible? I mean, I hate that. And then they opened up the funeral home to the public. And people came in by the thousands to view the bodies to see if they knew who they were. Yeah, I mean, it does sound strange, but I guess it's the only way they had to get the word out. Yeah, people had to see them to ID them. But it does freak me out, though, because thousands of people, like... Right. You know, not all of them were coming because they wanted to help. Yeah. Like some of them were just freaks and wanted to come and see dead bodies, which is just, I mean, sick, but. Or just true crime junkies. Yeah. 1930 versions of us. That's how you you show 
<laughs> I well, I wouldn't do it either. But that's how that that's what how they they got their fix for true crime. <laughs> I guess. I mean, I had a hard time even like because you can Google these pictures and they will. I am not posting them, but they're everywhere. I mean, it's wild. So it's really gross and awful. But you know, the times were the times. Okay, so also this is even weirder. Back in the day, they couldn't really keep bodies for long periods of time because they didn't have morgues, right? So they didn't have like these freezer things where you could put the bodies in to like keep them preserved for periods of time. Their embalming skills were just not what they were now back then. So they had to bury them. They had to bury the girls. And before they buried them, they still didn't know their identity, right? Because this had to be done in just a few days. And so they made death masks of their faces. Have you ever heard of this? A death mask? Uh, I mean, I feel like I've heard that term, but I don't have no idea where I would have heard it and what it means. So (laughs) it's like a wax or plaster Mm -hmm. cast of a person's face. It's freaky. It is creepy as crap. But, I mean, it's like one of those plaster things. Like, you know how people do their bellies? I think that's, like, the most common way to describe it. Like, when you're pregnant and you make, like, the cast of your bellies, which, like, why do people do that? I don't know. But Mm -hmm. that's, like, what they did. And there's pictures of these masks, too. And they've sent these pictures out everywhere because they were hoping that people would be able to look at these masks, see their faces, recognize them, and we could find out who they were. I mean, I know you're saying it's weird and I agree with you because I wouldn't want to see it, but that's pretty, I feel like pretty advanced it is. Like to be able to keep uh, their picture out there or like, you know, be able to. Right. Know, that's what I'm saying. We can't, it's easy for us to look back and be like, that is so creepy and weird, but they were doing everything they could. Like these people were, when I say they were in a frenzy to find out the identity of these girls, they really were like the whole country was like up in arms about who these sweet babies were. Okay, so they buried the girls. Funeral services were held and were attended by hundreds and hundreds of people. The local American Legion in Pennsylvania paid for the services, and Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts were the pallbearers. Like little oh my kids. Gosh. So sad, right? A headstone was placed on their graves that said, Babes in the woods, little children, oh, come unto me. And had a Bible mm. verse on it. It's really sad. Okay. Yeah. A few miles away from where the bodies were found, so this is a few days later, they found a suitcase. And in the suitcase, there were some children's clothing, girls' clothing, that were similar to what the girls were wearing when they were found. So they believed that maybe the suitcase belonged to them. And also in there were some children's books. And in one of the children's books was handwritten the name Norma. So, like, you know, back in the day, like, this book belongs to Beth Mm -hmm. or whatever. So, Norma was written in, like, the front flap of the book. Also, near where the suitcase was found, there was a vehicle found, like a random vehicle. And this vehicle was a blue sedan, and it appeared to have been abandoned due to lack of fuel. So, they ran out of gas and had to abandon the car. And it also had some items in it that appeared could be linked to the young girls. So just like clothing, maybe some toys. I don't know specifically what they were, but it was something that made them think that these two things that they found the car and the suitcase were linked back to these girls somehow. Mm -hmm. So they're on this hunt to try to find out who these girls are. Pennsylvania especially is like all up in arms trying to, you know, full force find out what happened. Meanwhile, 100 miles away in Altoona, Pennsylvania... Two bodies were found shot to death in an abandoned train station. So the police were very busy. Pennsylvania police, they were busy. These bodies were those of a man and a young woman. Both of them had been shot with a twenty-two rifle. The female's chest was exposed and she was shot through the heart and then the head. And the man had one gunshot wound to the head, which they believe to have been self-inflicted. The oh rifle, my. Yes. The rifle that was used to kill both of them was found between them. And the police didn't know who they were. 
Nobody knew that. There's no identification. No identification, nothing. But see these crafty Pennsylvania police, they took fingerprints of them and they were able to match some of the fingerprints for the man to military records. So the man had been in Mm. the military and they matched the fingerprints and he was then identified as a man by the name of Elmo Noakes of Rosewell, California. Elmo, hey? Elmo. Isn't, I didn't, I mean, I, it's a, like a furry little red monster. I didn't know we used this as a name, but I, I mean, it comes from somewhere, so whatever. But <laughs> um, so, and also I do want to say this identification process of this, I don't want to discount, like, because I'm telling it really quick in a story. This took weeks and weeks to do. Like, mm-hmm. you're not talking about, we just put it in CODIS and match them and whatever. Like, they had to physically look at the fingerprints and compare them and how many men were in the military at that time. And this took a long time to be able to identify who he was, right? Okay. But they still don't know who she was, the the female that was with him. But they they contact Elmo's family back in California. And they learned that Elmo had actually been missing for the last two weeks, along with his three young daughters and his niece. Whoa. (laughs) Okay. So that was his niece, probably not his wife. That's, oh, wait, no, two young daughters and the niece. Okay. Three young Three girls, not the woman that was with him. No, no. His three young daughters were missing and then also his niece. Oh, so the... Okay. So that's five people. So they then, at the same time that they're like trying to find his, um, who these fingerprints belong to, they run the plates. Well, it probably wasn't plates, but whatever it was in the 1930s, they run some kind of an identification tag on that abandoned car that they found back near the girls' bodies. And it also traced back to Elmo Noakes in California. Hmm. So. What's he doing on that side of the country? Exactly. (laughs) Here we have a connection, right? So they were finally able to identify all of these bodies. So we have Mm -hmm. Elmo Noakes, who was 31 years old. 31. Okay. We have Winifred Pierce, who goes by the name Winnie. This was the female companion that was with Elmo in the train station. She was 19. That's the niece. That's the niece. Then we have the girls that were found in the woods. The girls are Norma Sedgwick, who was 12, DeWilla Noakes, who was 10, and Cordelia Noakes, who was 8. Okay. So how did we get here? How Mm -hmm. did this family of five, all the way from California, end up in Pennsylvania, all dead? How did they get there? Why are they dead? What happened to them? Mm -hmm. And where, where's mom of the kids? We're going to get to mom. Okay. Right after this break. This episode of Crimes and Closets is brought to you by Best Fiends. With things opening back up, Life is getting pretty hectic. The kids are back in school. They're maybe doing sports and activities. Maybe you're driving into work every day again. If you're like me, then you're finding a harder and harder time to get some downtime. But I can always count on Best Fiends. Best Fiends is a mobile puzzle game with cute little characters, colorful worlds, and they add new levels and challenges all the time. It always piques my interest. When I need to zone out and relax, all I need is my closet, my phone, and my favorite Best Fiends characters, Jojo the Butterfly, and my cute little fly brittle, and the many more. So join millions of us who are already playing and download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Okay. Elmo James Noakes was born in January of 1903 in Utah. He served in the U.S. Marine Corps, and in 1923, he married a woman named Mary Hayford, and the couple lived in Salt Lake City, Utah. Mary had a daughter from a previous marriage named Norma Sedgwick. 
Mm-hmm. And Elmo became a very loving stepfather to her daughter, Norma, and raised her. The two then went on to have two more children together, DeWilla, who was born in May of 1924, and Cordelia, who was born in June of 1926. Aren't these names amazing? I, I, I'm, every time you say them, I think it, but Cordelia, I think was a name in like American horror story. They use that in one of Oh them. my gosh. Really? What if it's about that? Cause I've heard it before. I don't think Possibly. so. Cause I don't, the storyline doesn't sound familiar. Oh. So I don't think it is, but I love that name. I think and Dewilla. Okay. Dewilla. Yeah. Love. Different. It is. Okay. So then in July of 1932, Mary, Elmo's wife and mom died of septicemia which is like blood poisoning, essentially, following a self-induced abortion. What? all it says. That's all it says. I couldn't find anything else about it. Why is she trying to abort a baby? I don't know. Does it have something to do with Elmo? I don't know. Tell me more. Tell me more. Self-induced. I wonder yes. if that was common back then. Well, it would have had to have, I don't know about self-induced, but like we know from the Butterbox babies and all that, that, I mean, th- these things were happening. They were just illegal. So I would imagine if you wanted to have an abortion, you would, that would be an option is to do it yourself because you'd get in trouble if you went anywhere or there was mm-hmm. nowhere to go. Okay. That's all that's said about it though. So after his wife's death, Elmo moved the family to Rosewell, California to be closer to his sister so he could have help raising his girls, right? So Elmo worked for a company called Pacific Fruit Express, which is a refrigerator car leasing company. So they lease refrigerated cars to trains to take like produce and things like that. Elmo's niece, Winnie Pierce, who was his oldest sister's daughter, actually quit high school and came to work for Elmo in his house. So she would keep the girls and keep up with the house for Elmo while he worked his job and was gone during the day. But I think she lived there too. Elmo was known to have a good reputation. He was a hard worker. He had a good job. He had a nice home. His children were well-behaved and nice. And it said, specifically quoted, that his home was well-stocked with food, which is really interesting to say, but this is during the Great Depression. Oh, that's true. So So he's a wealthy person, probably. I don't know that he was wealthy, but I think he was comfortable. And like the fact that he had food to feed his family during the Great Depression when like hundreds of people and thousands of people, whatever, were dying of starvation and things like that. That's a lot. That's saying something about Mm -hmm. where you're at. So Winnie, let's talk about her. She was born in September of 1916 in Utah, again, to Elmo's oldest sister And her family relocated to Rosewell, California, like a little bit before she went to high school. And it's reported that her parents did not get along. And I think maybe her home life was not a super happy one. So when Uncle Elmo moved to California with his girls and asked her to move in, she was really happy to get away. And she was very thankful to Elmo for giving her like a home, essentially. Okay. So that's what we know about her. So here's the timeline. Here's what the police find out as they're going through Elmo's life and the events leading up to them being all found dead in Pennsylvania. In September of 1934, Elmo took out life insurance policies on the children. Always a bad idea. He also changed the beneficiary on his life insurance policy from his children to his sister, Winnie's mom. Oh. So his children were his beneficiaries. So if something were to happen to him, everything would go to his children. Well, he changed that to go to his sisters. In October, Elmo purchased a blue sedan car for $46. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I mean, I know it's the time, but it's so funny to hear that. Like 46 right. bucks. Here you go. <laughs> I know. That's actually why I left it in because it is just mm. a fun fact. On November 11th, Elmo packs up his three girls and Winnie, and takes off across the country. Why? We don't know. Mm. They traced sightings of them in various places across the country where he seemed to be traveling looking for work. So like everywhere he would stop, he would ask if there was work or if there was a job. Mm -hmm. 
On November 18th, the family, the whole family, all five of them were seen in a diner in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The girls were, they were all sitting there eating, but the three girls were actually sharing one meal. So they had ordered one meal from the diner and the three girls were sharing that one meal. So wow. Elmo has been reported to have been asking anyone if they had any work. And one of the other patrons was kind of listening to their conversation and heard what was going on. And she could tell that the family seemed to be having a really hard time, like financially. They didn't have a lot of money, it seemed like. And they actually shared their meals with the girls. Oh, how nice. So nice. That is the last sighting of all five of them together alive. So then we have a report that Elmo and Winnie stayed at a boarding house on November 22nd in Altoona. So this is where they were found, was in Altoona. They were alone. The children were not. Right. I was going to say just those two. Just Winnie and Elmo. On November 23rd, Winnie pawns her coat. So she goes in. She has nothing else. And she pawns her coat and gets a little bit of money. Elmo then takes that money and purchases a 22 caliber rifle for $2.55. No background checks back then. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> on November 24th, nothing would have showed up on a background check for him, I don't think. Well, anyway, but yeah, yeah, but I'm just saying you could just walk in and be like, walk out with a gun. <laughs> yep, for, for $2. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. On November 24th, the girls were then found in the woods. In back in the state park. And then a few days after that, Elmo and Winnie are found dead in the abandoned train station. So now we know who they are. We know where they came from. We know where they went. What we don't know is what happened to them or why, why this happened. Why did Elmo take his family and up and leave California? Why are they all dead? Tell me why again. Tell me yes. why. Are you going to tell me why? I'm really tell hoping. So. Ain't nothing but a heartache. <laughs> tell me why. Okay. So here are the theories. We don't know. We don't know exactly oh, what happened to them, me. but we have theories. You can pick one. You're going to have one to pick from. It's okay. The most common theory, the one that I believe actually, so I'm telling you first because I can. Elmo and Bias. Winnie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Elmo and Winnie had entered into a romantic relationship. Because mm -hmm. incest is a thing, people. It happens. Mm -hmm. The two of them were being told by family and their community that this relationship was not going to fly because it's gross. And so they had decided that they wanted to be together and they ran away. They ran away together. They packed everything up and they took off across the country. They left Elmo's well-paying, successful job, their beautiful home, and drove across the country in search of a new life together, thinking that Elmo would find work along the way. But it didn't turn out that way. He couldn't find a job because it's the Great Depression, dude. And the family quickly ran out of money and ran out of options and could no longer survive, essentially. So Elmo and Winnie made the decision that they were going to kill the children in order to like save them from further suffering. And then they did that and tried to move on, but couldn't because their resources were limited and they probably felt super guilty. And so then they decided to kill themselves. Yeah. I mean, that makes a whole That's a a lot of Except it's weird that he bought life insurance policies for the children and why do you do that? It almost seems like you were planning on killing them. So, but who did that money go to? Him? No, it went to the, um, I think that like, it went to the sister too. Right. Because I know whatever, like if he died, his stuff, but I mm -hmm. guess that would, the same thing would happen. Exactly. Yeah. And so why did he change it to the sister also last minute? Yeah. Like it's like you were you know, all like, planning yeah, to die. Right. Weird, right? Yeah. If you were setting off on this new life. I don't, I mean, also, is it possible that maybe that was, um, he's maybe paying his sister off to stay quiet or, you know. You'd have to die in order to. Right. I know. Um, or is it possible that it was off, um, something that was common because they were 
going off on this trek across the country that if something happened to them, because this is like an unknown thing, I don't know. I mean, like traveling may have been a little bit more dangerous. Like, okay, if something happens, at least you'll get to all of us. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's just possible. Thought. Yeah. I don't know. It's very <laughs> weird. That's the only hiccup for me in that one. I, yeah. I don't, I don't get the life insurance. Okay. Right. Now Elmo's family. They do not believe that that this they ran off together, that he killed his children. They believe him to be a family man, a loving guy who would never do anything to his children or himself or anyone he loved. And I don't think that they believed that they were in a romantic relationship together either. I think that they believe he took the niece with him because she was caring for the children and he needed help. Right. But mm-hmm. So that's his family. They believe that well, they believe a couple of things. One thing that they believe is that the girls, they were living in their car, right? Because they didn't have money to pay for a place to stay. And that maybe the girls suffocated as a result of car exhaust and they died accidentally. And the parents were so grief stricken that they just couldn't go on. And so they committed suicide, which it's possible. I don't, I mean, in my experience, when somebody dies of like carbon monoxide inhalation in a car, something has been stuffed in the pipe yeah. to put the exhaust into the car. Like things have to be modified in a certain way. I don't know that there is any evidence in the car that would or show. Or inside like a garage or something where right. it's like doesn't have anywhere to go. Like they were out in the open. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So – I don't know, but this is one of the theories the family believes. Another theory that the family believes is that the that Elmo was being pursued by an armed gang. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what the evidence is. I would be very interested to look up and see what armed gangs were even happening back in 1934. And like, what's their story? Why are we scared of armed gangs? I don't know. But they believe, I mean, it does explain why he up and left. Yeah. He took everything and like ran, essentially looking like he fled. It also explains the life insurance issues because he thought they were all going to be killed. And he they thought maybe he's fleeing to save himself and his family. Mm-hmm. Again, yeah. tell me, tell me more. Tell me why. I don't know. There are other theories that have come in that believe this was the work of a satanic cult. Again, there's no real evidence of that. One of the daughters had a mark on her forehead, which they thought could be a symbol possibly of a satanic cult, but it turned out that it was just like a scratch and like completely superficial and was of no mark whatsoever. Were those big back then? Satanic cults in the 1930s? Don't know. I mean, there were all there's always been witch hunts, let's be real. Yeah, well, yeah. But the real annoying part is that we really don't know. We right. have no idea what exactly happened on this road trip and what the motives were for the death of these people. In 19- Also, were they not, I'm sorry, able to um, determine, how, like, I know they suffocated the girls, but, like, would they have um, found chemicals if it was a due to car exhaust or something at at that time. I'm not sure that that was a possibility. I mean, I think that truth to be told, I was surprised that carbon monoxide was even a thing in the 1930s. Like that kind of surprised me a little bit. It's not stated where they did like whether they did these testing to see. I don't think the police believe that that's what happened. This is just a theory of the family. The children were buried by this point. Right. Yeah. So you know, we don't, we just don't know. Yeah. We don't know what happened. So in 1968, the Pennsylvania Highway Workman put up a sign where the girls' bodies were found that said, on this spot were found three babes in the woods. Case photos, newspaper articles, artifacts from the case can all be viewed to this day at the Pennsylvania State Police Museum in Hershey, Pennsylvania. So they've kept all of this. It was a really big deal. And the investigation Mm -hmm. was a really big deal for the police department at that time, like we've talked about. Interestingly, Elmo and Winnie were later buried in the same cemetery in Pennsylvania where the three girls were buried. Which is weird because remember, they're all from California, but they were buried like 100 feet apart. But they are in the same cemetery. 
Wow. I, I, I guess that they didn't like transport bodies. They there. probably didn't have means to do that. Yeah. But that is the story of the babes in the woods. Wow. So thank you, Maddie. I hate that we don't know. The suggestion. <laughs> I know. I really yeah. want to know what Maddie thinks. So let us know. Yes, please. Send, send us your theory or if you agree with one of these or if you have a separate one. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or anybody, anybody that has an idea of what they get us, get hit us up on social media when Beth is posting this week. Like, what do you think? What do you think happened to the babes in the woods? <laughs> Three precious kids, all five of them. It's so <gasps> tragic. It's like really sad. It's so random. It's the 1930s, which just automatically gives it like an air of creepiness. Yeah. It was a very haunting story to research. Very and just a random. Though. Like, I guess, you know, maybe their body's not so random if, you know, their um, car ran out of gas there and that's like, they were like, we can't travel. We can't walk on foot with three kids and whatever. I don't know. You know, whatever happened to them there. But that abandoned train station, like what? They just happened upon that and they were like, I, I think they were trying to find a place that was like off to its. Well, I mean, who knows? Maybe the armed gang killed them and put them there. Or maybe they yeah. were there because it was abandoned and they wanted to be in private and had nowhere else to go. So, yeah. Or maybe they were even staying there, you know, because they couldn't Possibly. afford hotels anymore or whatever. Who knows? Who knows? Lots, lots of questions in the air today. Gosh. Let the rabbit hole begin. So mad at you for leaving these questions in my head. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm not going to be able to move on. I'm going to be like looking at things. You have a whole week to figure out this case before we have another one. <laughs> <laughs> before you think about another one. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Oh, gosh. Well, thank you, Maddie, for suggesting it. Thank you, Beth, for telling it. You're welcome. It was, it was good. I liked it. liked it a lot. So if you liked it, rate and review us. Let us know. Find us all over the place on social. We pretty much interact mostly on Instagram. Let's be real. I mean, and email. but we are, yeah. Oh yeah. Email. Um, and oh, I, I don't know if we should mention this, but our website will not really be functioning at some point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, just so you know, because we don't really feel like we use it as much. Um, It'll still exist, but I don't think it's going to function the way like some people send stuff in through that suggestion. Email us directly, crimesandclosets at gmail.com, just so you know. Sometime in May, end of May, I think. Yes. Um, so hit us up, email, Instagram, Facebook, and keep listening. And as Beth mentioned last week, share us. Share us with your friends because I feel like that's where we start to gain some momentum is when people send us Send us as a suggestion to a friend. So if you know people who like true crime, send us to them. And always remember, the world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closet.